Uh, thanks, Ben, for the um, for having me. I think this is a great um, you know uh, opportunity to share knowledge in the current pandemic situation. And so today, I wanted to talk about something that is, I think, important in, in a scientific career, when that's making a change um, from one focus to another, and how um, I went about changing quite a bit from what I did in my training to um, what became a big part of my research lab. Um, so I'm an associate professor, which means I just got tenure last year. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter at Grice Chemistry. So DePaul, just to kind of um, stage us here, DePaul's a primarily undergraduate institution in, as far as what I would consider, consider for my department. Um, it's a Catholic university in Chicago. Um, we have two campuses in, in Chicago, one directly downtown in what's called the Loop, and then one up north a little bit in Lincoln Park, and that's where the sciences are, that's where I am. They're accessible by the L on the CTA train, which is um, cool when, you know, pre-pandemic. Um, so we have undergraduate and master's degrees, no PhDs, no postdocs in chemistry. But we have a fairly large department. We have 14 research active chemistry faculty and then some um, teaching uh, focused faculty as well. Um, and so we're on a quarter system as well, which means we teach um, three quarters, um, and the normal teaching load for a research active faculty is two, 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 where one is a lecture and one half is a lab. Um, and also DePaul is not to be confused with DePa, which is another primarily undergraduate university in Indiana, just FYI. Okay, so working as a PUI, um, just for those who are interested in possibly going into that career, I wanted to say something quickly about that, is that I joined, uh, I went to a PUI instead of a research one school because I wanted to work alongside undergraduates and master's students. Uh, there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction, uh, more student faculty um, collaboration. We balance our research with teaching and service. So I'm not just research, I'm not just teaching um, to balance of all. Um, you can be your, um, <clears throat> You, know, you can be the only chemist in your field or chemical engineer or, or whatever researcher in your field, but realize that you're not alone. Um, there are lots of ways to collaborate and connect with other people. And this is this is a great example of it through um, Twitch or Discord. Um, so you want to stay connected with, with your community um, of like-minded people. And one of the ways I've done that is through this um, website called Ionic Viper. Um, and they have a Discord channel too. Um, so we talk about inorganic chemistry. Um, and teaching and research on that Discord channel. But it's an um, online website where we store teaching materials for, um, for inorganic chemistry. I also am part of a small group of people who meet online and discuss um, organometallic chemistry, which is a subset of inorganic. So these people have been great um, for sharing ideas, discussing thoughts, bouncing ideas off of each other. Um, it's a great, again, these kind of like find your communities to share knowledge. All right, um, in my group, there's, we do a lot of research um, with, again, with undergraduates and master's students. I do a lot of CO2 reduction where we're trying to use homogeneous catalysts for CO2 reduction or hydride transfer agents like boral hydride um, and looking at how they work and how to make them better. Um, I also do some CH activation with platinum complexes that is turning, trying to turn alkanes into alkenes um, and hydrogen um, using phosphate ligands. But today I want to talk about a different area bioinorganic, which has really started growing in my lab um, and has become a big part of what I do. Um, so we're going to focus on bioinorganic. Um, but of course, you know, if you want to talk about CO2 reduction or platinum CH activation, I'm always happy to talk and chat about science. So I'm not a bioinorganic chemist. Um, I was trained as an organometallic chemist in by Karen Goldberg um, at the University of Washington. She's now at the University of Penn, uh, UPenn. Um, and then basically all I did was take NMRs of homogeneous soluble platinum complexes. Um, that was about it. <laughs> some, you know, some other experiments, but mainly lots of NMR based work. I worked in a glove box most of the time. Then I did a postdoc on electrocatalytic CO2 reduction. Again, homogeneous complexes, worked in the glove box. I learned electrochemistry and IR, um, IRCC, but, um, so how did I get into bioinorganic, right? These are those two areas um, for my PhD and postdoc were very, very not bioinorganic. Well, um, part of Ionic Viper was having yearly workshops to learn about teaching. And there was one in 2014 that was funded by the now defunct CCWCS, which is a great NSF program that was funding 
workshops, but the workshop was on bioinorganic chemistry and making teaching materials for bioinorganic chemistry. And so we interacted with these R1 professors, um, Ann Jones, Tom Mead, Janet Mero, Morrow, and Tom Halloran. Um, so Ann Jones, I think, is from the University of Arizona or Arizona State. Tom Mead and Tom O'Halloran are at Northwestern. Janet Morrow's, I think, Buffalo. But they presented their research, and then we turned that into teaching materials. And so I learned a lot. And after that, I came back and taught bioinorganic chemistry as a master's level course afterwards. So I was getting confidence in, hey, I can go into this field, and I think it's kind of interesting. So I want to tell you two stories today, and they're, they're certainly collaborative stories. Um, I wouldn't, couldn't have been able to do all of this on my own, and you'll see how collaborators play into it as we go. Uh, one is talking about mimicking zinc enzyme active sites. So what can we do to understand zinc enzymes uh, from an inorganic uh, chemistry point of view? And so we'll talk about how some of the things we've been doing with crystal structures and solution studies. I'll talk about some synchrotron radiation studies we did. And then how we can learn something else interesting that, you know, I'm kind of a curiosity driven researcher. I find something interesting and I go after it. And so we actually found some stuff related to materials. And then I'll talk about a different collaboration. It's also bioinorganic. Um, Chromenopyridines and metal based drugs. We tried for some metals, it didn't work out, as you'll see. And we finally get some metals involved again. I'm an inorganic chemist, so I like metals. That should be no surprise. All right. So zinc and biology, right? So zinc is actually the second most abundant transition metal in the human body. You've got like three to four grams of it in your body. And you've got more iron, that's the first. Um, it plays a lot of roles. It plays structural roles in, 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 in uh, proteins, like zinc finger proteins or um, other structural places, but it also plays a catalytic role. It hydrolyzes um, various substrates by activating water. And so it can be a carbonic anhydrase that turns CO2 to bicarbonate and back and forth, matrix metalloprotease, this thing chews up proteins, histone deacetylase that deacetylates histone proteins that are involved in DNA packing. And the active sites tend to have um, three ligands that are from amino acids, either nitrogen or oxygen ligands. Um, here's all nitrogen. This is for carbonic anhydrase. This one here is HDAC. Um, and then a, in a water that's been deprotonated. And so that becomes a nucleophilic water and the zinc is a Lewis acid and it can hydrolyze um, strong bonds. Now drugs have been developed to target these. Um, I think I'll talk more about these drugs. Um, one is specifically called Vorinostat or Saha. And it's a hydroxamic acid. And it was developed by um, Breslow and Marx to treat cer certain types of cancer by, by targeting HDACs. So what's a hydroxamic acid? It was certainly not something that I learned in undergrad. Um, it's not something that's like taught in organic chemistry. Um, but it turns out to be really interesting and fairly, um, fairly pervasive, actually. So you can think of it as like an amide that's been oxidized at the NH. Um, there's an NOH bond there. So it's, um, it's formed from a hydroxyl amine and an, and an acyl species. Now, the interesting thing here is when you deprotonate this OH, which is the most acidic part of it, um, the metal can be bidentate, and that makes it more stable than a monodentate ligand. So it just grabs it with two sites. And both are oxygens. Um, if you know something about hard soft acid base theory, it's the idea that hard acids like hard bases and soft acids like soft bases. So oxygen is a hard base. So it, this likes oxophilic metals. So things that are higher um, oxidation state and earlier transition metals. Um, so here's the picture of Saha. You can see there's a hydroxamic acid and a long chain and a cap at the end. But there's even some of these in nature. Um, so for example, siderophores, which are basically weapons made by bacteria to grab iron. Uh, some of them have hydrox um, hydroxamic acids on them. So this is deferoxamine, um, which is a bacterial siderophore. You can see the hydroxamic acids. This thing wraps around iron three and holds on really tight. Um, and so it's a way of sequestering iron either away from enemy bacteria or just to help the only the self bacteria. They can also be um, NO donors in nitric oxide, which is the poisonous gas at high concentrations, but at low concentrations, it's a neuro, neurotransmitter and a vasodilator. Um, so they found that these can be broken down in, in the body um, or electrochemically or, um, to form NO. So lots of interesting chemistry there that, um, again, I, I was learning about this as I was um, you know, in this bio inorganic workshop and also from my colleague who was studying hydroxamic acids, Dr. Jin. Um, she was the one who was originally studying hydroxamic acids and, and I started collaborating with her and became very curious about them. They're also are used in materials. They're 
because they're great at binding early transition metals or oxophilic metals, they form self-assembled monolayers on the oxides like TiO2 or ITO, and you can use them for surface chemistry and materials. So really interesting functional group that I think doesn't get as much attention, at least in the undergraduate curriculum, um, as it should. So that's a hydroxamic acid. Now, Saha was an interesting drug. It's been studied. This was developed back in the late 1990s. Um, and the free drug has been crystallized before, and the active site of an HDAC has been crystallized with one. But there were no small molecule um, compounds of zinc bound to it that I had seen that were crystal structures. So I like structures. I like to see um, the geometry of something. So we set out to try to crystallize it. And to do that, we decided to use a big bulky, greasy um, supported group. This is what's called a trisperazole borate ligand. Um, it's big, it's greasy, um, it's negatively charged, and it kind of wraps around the zinc to form like a pocket. Um, here you can see the zinc hydroxide, um, then these phenyl groups, which are benzene rings, are out there kind of protecting the pocket. And then you can add a, a zinc binding group, like a, a um, hydroxamic acid. And this has been done before with other hydroxamic acids. We were just curious about Saha. Or, or Renostat, this is commercially available drugs. So my undergrad student, Phoebus, did this. Um, he synthesized the zinc hydroxide and started adding Saha and other hydroxamic acids to it. And we were able to grow crystal structure. And when you grow a crystal, you mail it off to your crystallographer and they shoot it with x-rays and get, send you back a structure. And you can look at it using software like Mercury. So here's the structure. So sure enough, it is bidentate. Um, this is the nitrogen, oxygens are in red. And then the chain is kind of far away, but interestingly in the unit cell, this chain is hydrogen bonding to another um, of the NH on this hydroxamic acid. I've excluded the hydrogens here for clarity because there's a lot of them. So this was a white solid. And we started to think about what other bidentate um, ligands are out there that are monoanionic when you deprotonate them. And um, I'd heard about 8-hydroxyquinoline, which is also another drug-like molecule. And so we bound that and got a crystal structure of that, and that was yellow. Now, qualitatively, um, 8-HQ binds stronger than Saha, and that was just because you could take the Saha complex, which is colorless, and add 8-HQ, which is also colorless, and you'd make the yellow compound. So 8-HQ is better than hydroxamic acids, at least for this system. We were able to publish this um, paper in Polyhedron in 2016. We also had some other fun structures. This is a, a, a uh, again, this is commercially available bis hydroxamic acid, and you can get two bridging zinc guys. Um, and then uh, I just, we did valproic acid just because it's also another known HDAC inhibitor. And sure enough, we could get a structure shown down here. Um, so we synthesized and characterized all of these in organic solvents, right? So that's not really biology like. Um, it's not mimicking like biological systems very well. Uh, but you know, at least we got some structures and we could understand their behavior. And we could also look at the bond lengths around the bound hydroxamic acid. So you could look at the, you know, the zinc oxygen bond, you could look at the NO bond, the NC bond, and the CO bond. In fact, you can draw a resonance structure that makes the CN bond more double bond like. Um, and the CO bond more single bond like. And in fact, you can see quite a bit of variation in those. So if you look, here's the CO double bond. It's quite short in the molecule we made, but then um, it can be shorter or longer depending on um, you know other types of hydroxamic acids. Um, the same thing with the um, CN bond. It was quite short, but it could be longer. And so there's some variation, it seems, in, in the... Um, you know, this spectrum of, of resonance structures. Um, and we always see hydrogen bonding um, from this NH to something and all of these structures, if you go back and look at their unit packing in the, in the crystal structure, there always seems to be NH hydrogen bonding, which is probably important for zinc binding. It might stabilize that uh, hydroxytamic acid on there. And I went back and looked at some of the crystal structures in PDB, the protein database of, um, of some of the, you know, Saha bound to a protein, sure enough, there was like a histidine nearby in hydrogen bonding distance um, to that NH. So it seems to be that was a um, maybe possibly an important um, component to stabilizing these um, interactions. So um, that was a fun little paper in polyhedron in 2016. Um, but that, that didn't really tell us much about, you know, the solution chemistry. It didn't tell us, you know, in, in more, um, you know, 
didn't give us a lot about the thermodynamics, it was just a structure. So thankfully, my colleague, Dr. Li Guajin, had a ITC, which is an isothermal titration calorimeter. Um, basically, it's a really good calorimeter, and it can do things on small scales, and it gets um, equilibrium binding constants and delta H's and delta S's of reaction and the number of things binding per metal, et cetera. Um, so she was doing a bunch of studies in her lab, and um, we picked, in, in collaboration with her, we picked some different um, small molecule ligands that might mimic the kind of pocket of an enzyme active site, the nitrogen or oxygen bindings from amino acids. And then she looked at how they bound to zinc in solution um, <clears throat> in an aqueous buffer that's had um, kind of is certainly more biologically relevant than an organic solvent. Um, and then it, this had been done before in, a, um, in what's called a potentiometric method, but that was with just pure water, which isn't really biologically relevant. Um, biological systems of water and electrolytes and buffer and, and things. So um, then what she did um, with Sophia, her student and her other students um, did was start adding in hydroxamic acids and AHQ to these things and see how strong is that interaction. And we published this in Dalton Trans, uh, Transactions in 2016, if you want to go read the paper. Um, and so here's one of the tables from the paper. And you can see, you can get all sorts of information. The log K, the association constant, so it's 10 to the 7.6 is how well it binds. Uh, the number of ligands per zinc, right? And we can look at the different ligands. They're all about one. Um, and then we can compare that with the potentiometric method, which assumes one. And they had stronger binding um, values, but remember that it was in pure water and we've got like buffer with added salt and things. So there are competing um, ligands for the zinc. And so it's, it makes sense that the apparent um, binding constant is lower because it's got other things to compete with. Um, so yeah, it was 0.15 molar uh, sodium chloride and then this NEM buffer, uh, I think it was about 100 millimolar. Whereas the other potentiometric was only sodium perchlorate and water, not buffer. So um, anyway, so this tells us we can get it to bind these these ligands, and then we started to throw um, AHA, which is a hydroxamic acid, and 8HQ, which is a hydroxyquinoline um, ligand, which are drug-like molecules at these mimics. Um, and so again, AHA bound, but it turned out AHQ bound stronger. So if you look at the Ka. Um, this is a mixed methanol buffer solution because the AHQ wasn't fully soluble in water. So we had to mix some organic solvent in there to uh, make it more soluble. And so the, the bond order is it's about 10 to the fourth um, for the binding constant, whereas AHA is only about 10 to the two. So just like what we had seen qualitatively in our previous paper, it looks like AHQ is a stronger ligand. So that's good. We've found something that probably might be a better zinc binding group. Now, of the supporting ligands, only this um, picolilamine, uh, which is one of those the supporting ligands we tried, seemed to be form what's called a ternary complex, where you keep the supporting ligand on, you have zinc, and you've got your um, your AHQ or AHA. So <clears throat> that was kind of the, the conclusion from this paper: is that um, AHQ binds better, and then to make a supporting species in um, in kind of buffer, which is more biologically relevant, you need this BPA ligand. Okay, this is just thermodynamics, right, which is useful, but there's a disconnect here, All right? So I have the first paper that I was talking about, we did an organic solvent with this big greasy ligand, and then the second one we were trying to do in, in solution, but the structures could be very different. And so the question is, how could we get solution phase structural data for these uh, things in buffer? Uh, you can't take an NMR and buffer very well because you've got a bunch of junk in there um, and it's in water, so you have to use the D2O, but then you'll see all the buffer components. And zinc has no, it's not like, there's no proton NMRs on zinc, right? So we're going to need a bigger instrument. And I had learned about XAFs in my postdoc and also in my, um, in the bio and organic workshop, and I thought this would be perfect for it. Um, XAFs basically hits your element of interest, and it is element specific with um, x-rays and causes an electron to scatter. And then the scattering of the electron can observe some fluorescence or a transmission. And you can um, basically model that scattering pattern to get a structure. 
So we applied to go to Argonne National Lab, which is in here in Illinois. Um, we got it. Um, so we, what we did is we went there with a group of students and me. Um, and here's the you know the building, the sunrise or sunset. I can't remember because we were there, there running data 20, uh, 72 hours straight. So we worked in shifts. Um, here's the sample holder. It was you put a little solution in this Teflon cup. You cap it with, with a Kapton film. You go stick it in the beam. Um, this is kind of the walk toward where you can put the sample in. Here's the station where you observe and collect all the data. It's a big circular building, and so they have trikes you can ride around in. And here's some of my undergraduates and master student um, who are there to help us. So each each sample took about ten runs, which were um, took about four-ish hours, uh, depending on the parameters. We were just running and running the samples. Um, this is what the data looks like. If you haven't seen XF data before, you get this is the energy, and you hit the edge where you hit you enough energy to eject an electron, and then it it scatters. And so you take this and you process it into what's called k-space, um, which is this here. But then you can process it into a radial distance, which is basically from the center point. What is you know how is it scattering out? And then you can use this to fit to a geometric structure. So this is what you use to fit. Um, the data. This is not a straightforward process, uh, I should say. And it took me a long time to even get acquainted with it. I still have not processed all of the data from that 2016 trip. But the way that we do it is there's this free software called Athena and Artemis. So Athena, you collect your data, you process it, normalize it, um, fix baselines, average it, merge it, you know, check that it looks good. So now you've got the data. But then you need some other input. You need a a get, initial yes. So this could be an x-ray structure or a DFT calculated density functional theory calculated structure. You truncate that structure down to just the things around the atom that you're exciting. Um, you set those zinc to your central coordinates and you make this fitting input called FEF. And that runs in this other software, Artemis, where you try to fit that data onto your, or fit that structure onto your data. And then you repeat. Because <laughs> usually the first couple tries is not going to work. So it, it takes a lot of um, guesswork, but it also takes having some good ideas about what's going on ahead of time. Um, so thankfully, one of the structures we did was pretty straightforward in terms of figuring it out, um, but led to an interesting kind of materials -y science side, John. We were curious about zinc bis-8 hydroxyquinoline, which is two 8HQs on zinc with nothing else. Uh, that compound's only soluble in like organic solvents. So we did this in DMSO actually. Um, and it's pretty well known. It's actually um, a, it's a, used in OLEDs and things like that. The aluminum version is well known too, as well. AL, uh, it's called ALQ3 sometimes. And so this zinc thing, is, zinc's kind of promiscuous. It's got um, a D10, so it does no benefit being a certain geometry. And it could be trigonal um, bipyramidal, it could be tetrahedral, it could be octahedral, depending on like just how the ligands pack. And so Already we knew that several different structures were known. There was a tetramer that had been crystallized before and studied. There was a monomer with waters that had been crystallized and studied. And then there was monomer with various other ligands put on them, the HQs are here. And so we were curious about the DMSO solution. What is it? Is it a cluster, a monomer, et cetera? So we used XFs and we also used DOZI NMR for, with a different collaborator, which DOZI NMR allows you to separate signals based on diffusion constant which is basically size. So you can, it's like a 2D NMR plot where you can see size versus signal. Really useful for looking at nanoparticles and other materials where we're trying to see what's bigger than what. So based on all of this and the XFs data and the fitting, we found that it was actually octahedral six coordinate with the DMSOs bound. And so not only that, we went on and did um, some more photochemistry stuff with it. I have a collaborator and colleague, um, Dr. Griffin, who's a physical chemist and he likes studies OLEDs and, and these types of materials. So we did a bunch of photochemistry on it. Um, and that was published in a paper in J Physics Chem um, from uh, uh, <clears throat> with students again as co-authors. So myself and Dr. Griffin, Phoebus and Caesar, um, Asia and Fatima were these four were students and grads and grads on the project. Cool. Now, this was a one that was easy to fit. We were having trouble with the rest. Um, so one of my students, Ying Ji Zhang, um, he's come, come in and has tried to help me figure out 
other information to help us get good guesses about the, the structure. And interestingly, we have to be careful about solvents, right? So um, here's just zinc chloride, right, which is the zinc starting material we were using for the ITC data and the XFs data. It has very different conductivity in different solvents. So in DMSO, there's like no conductivity. In methanol water mix, there's some, but in water, there's more. And we benchmarked this against sodium chloride and figured out that this basically tells us it's making three ions in water. So it's completely ionizing. The two chlorides are coming off in water and we believe in buffer as well. This, this had to be done in pure water because our conductivity probe only works with um, low concentrations of ions. So if we do it in buffers, just the signals are swamped out. We could also do our zinc BPA dichloride, which you can make independently. That BPA is that ligand that worked for the ITC data, and it shows very similar behavior too. So already we're seeing um, some lessons that we can then say, okay, zinc BPA dichloride forms the same number of ions as zinc chloride. Zinc chloride's got a bit more um, conductivity because it's, of it's got it has known um, acid-base chemistry, and so therefore can make more ions by making H plus. So in the lower conductance in the mixed water methanol solvent is likely just due to the fact that you get lower conductivities in these organic solvents. Um, so this basically tells us that the zinc chloride and zinc BPA um, behave the same. So I'm still processing this data from 2016 because I have you know many different scans, but we've got some stuff already. So first of all, zinc chloride is hexaqua in buffer which has excess chloride. Um, so even the presence of chloride in the buffer, it's still this guy. We were able to fit it to the, and get this um, bond distance thing. So um, you can do this for things in the solid phase too, solid or um, liquid phase. You can get bond distances and the number of, number of different atoms around it, et cetera. Um, and the literature value for this, you know, we were pretty much smack dab in other values. That's good. That kind of shows us that uh, what we were doing was was um, good, but then it, we're still struggling with some of the other ones. For example, this is a compound that looked like it fit pretty well, except that um, this one one of them was very weird. So maybe it's not this. We have to go back and like reiterate by trying some other initial guess. Um, we also added AHA to just sync by itself, and we've been able to model and ca calculate density functional theory that it's this guy. Um, we've done zinc dichloride in DMSO, which you remember it had no solid, no conductivity. And sure enough, it fits to either one DMSO bound or two DMSOs bound being, um, again, not ionic. So it's got no charge, so it's gonna have no conductivity, right? So that's how the conductivity probe allowed us to kind of get better guesses for our um, XFs input. Um, so those are the published stories, um, but we're still working hard on this. So we're still processing all that zinc, those, those zinc data um, we have. We also have some cobalt data that I'm gonna process. But what we're doing now too, as well as looking at 8HQ and saying, okay, we know 8HQ is better than hydroxamic acids. Let's see if we can make it even better, right? There's lots of ways you could substitute this in various locations with electron donating or withdrawing groups or bulky groups. And so we're just, just barely started to scratch the surface of this. Uh, so this, for example, if you just take the methyl substitute one here, you can get the crystal structure with the TP. Um, and indeed, the, this methyl actually adds some steric bulk. And so this zinc nitrogen bond is, um, you know, is longer than in the other one, but in, actually the zinc oxygen bond is shorter. So maybe it's kind of balancing out. We don't have ITC data yet for it, like thermodynamic data, but that'll be interesting to compare with uh, the different geometries. Um, another one that we started looking at was a nitro substituted. And these are commercially available. So nitro is an electron withdrawing group. It should make this a stronger acid. Well, we know that zinc is promiscuous, but we actually got some interesting structures from this. So for example, in acid nitrile, uh, if you take zinc, just the bis 8HQ version, you get this dimer. And so this is two of them bridging through zinc oxygen bonds and then packing together in a unit cell. So that's a dimer. You can get a monomer with water's bound if you crystallize it from water in acetyl nitrile. Or if you crystallize it from um, non-coordinating solvents, you actually get a polymer. So here's one of them. 
one of the atom uh, molecules here, but then the nitro bridges to another zinc, and then that bridges to another nitro and to another zinc. And it forms these kind of zigzag long chains that really form like a, a flat um, poly two-dimensional polymer. Um, and we're excited to explore the photochemical um, and you know, material properties of this two-dimensional um, material. And it's just cool that just by modifying just the solvent, you can affect very different structures from the same starting material. All right, so that's the zinc story as it stands. So we've been able to model zinc enzyme active sites using small molecules, um, using X-ray crystallography, ITC, and XF data. Um, <clears throat> and then once we have these like XF data, we're gonna to try to compare them with the protein structures and see if, are they close? Like uh, are, are these molecules we are claiming to be zinc enzyme active site models actually modeling? Um, and the fact that AHQs seem to be better than than hydroxamic acids really points out that we're probably better off going towards AHQs for making drugs. Um, and so we're looking at various substituents. And like I said, we've also got some cobalt data. Um, cobalt and zinc are often used interchangeably um, in terms of, but then cobalt's got some interesting redox active chemistry too. And so we did go to Argonne and collect a bunch of XFs on cobalt compounds, um, which I'll work on processing once I'm done with the zinc ones. Um, what I would love to do is find another collaborator to actually test these 8-HQs and hydroxamic acids in actual zinc-based proteins. And so um, one of my colleagues uh, might do it with me, but of course, if you're working anywhere in this field or know somebody who does something like this, I would love to chat. So that is one story. Um, and again, before, I think that was the first zinc chemistry I've ever done, um, right? Before I'd been doing platinum chemistry or like uh, rhenium and manganese CO2 reduction chemistry. But it turned out to be really interesting. And um, we were able to make some contributions to the field. So now let's look at something else that I kind of, again, started as a side project um, or, you know, not the main focus of my original research, but then took off. So we had this Rosalind Franklin um, and DePaul agreement. So Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science is a med school in North Chicago, which is not actually Chicago. It's actually closer to, to um, Wisconsin. So you can see here DePaul is down here near Chicago. Um, and then here's the Wisconsin Illinois state line. And then Rosalind Franklin's up here. It's actually closer to, to um, Wisconsin than it is to sh Chicago. But there was this, we have this agreement where students can fast track into their med school apply it early and so on. But there was also for a while a joint research agreement. And so we had these really cool um, collaborative brainstorming sessions where we'd spend the day talking with faculty from both places. Um, and there were grants we could apply to. So we got internal funding to support these projects. Um, and so the internal funding support had, required that you had at least one PI from both institutions um, for the project. And there was no guarantee that they would actually approve it. Um, but what happened is we did get an approval to do something. And it was an idea that um, happened out of me talking to two people from our firms. One was Dr. Shiva Puchir Patil, who's a medicinal chemist, kind of synthetic organic medicinal chemist background. And he'd been making compounds to look at cancer. Um, and he called these, these chromine compounds, these kind of pretty um, complex compounds here. SP stands for Shiva Puchir Patil. And um, then Dr. Guillaume Morris, who was in immunology or molecular biology, biology, microbiology, he was studying liver fibrosis and hepatitis C. So he was doing a lot of morphology of cells and how they behave and then like the proteins they're expressing. And so we sat together and came up with an idea and wrote a proposal um, and to apply for this internal funding and they funded it. Um, this was our rather ambitious initial proposal. And I thought, hey, you know, there are metals who are that are drugs. And I told them that yes, like cisplatin has platinum in it. And there are gold anti-rheumatoid anti arthritis drugs, um, you know, things like that. So we thought, okay, well, what if we can make one of Shiva's, uh, Shiva's drugs into something that can bind metals really well and put a metal on it? And so then you've got a metal with ligands. Both the metal and the ligands are drugs. So it's kind of a double warhead. And then we would test them against cancer, um, like liver fibrosis and hepatitis C and things like that. And so the first thing, it kind of two main aims. We're going to make these things. Um, so make the chromines, make the stick them on metals, and then screen them um, for liver cancer and hepatitis C. Um, so as you'll see, things didn't go according to plan. And that's how a lot of research goes, but we learned some cool stuff along the way. 
Um, so again, this was our proposal. Now, making the organic chrominopyridines is actually fairly straightforward. This has been done before. Um, it's a multi-component reaction. It's done in one pot. You throw one of these, one of these, and two of these in, and you just heat them together. And you get this out in decent yields, and the only um, byproduct is water. So it's pretty atom economical, too. And you can vary a lot. You can change the groups on this, on the sulfur. You can change the R groups out here based on what aldehyde you buy. Um, so you can make all sorts of various substitution patterns, right? So this was why it was appealing from kind of a drug synthesis um, perspective is it's easy to make kind of a library of different things. Um, and there was no chromatography and only one step, right? So you just precipitate it and recrystallize it from DMF and water, which is nice. Chromatography can be time consuming um, and sometimes it, it, you know, it doesn't separate. So at first Dr. Patil, he made them, but then, you know, fairly straightforward, my undergrads were making them soon. Um, and then we would characterize them um, using NMR. Um, I tried to get crystal structures for the longest time, um, but like NMR, you know, UV-Vis, mass spec, elemental analysis, and then we sent them to Dr. Warris for testing. Um, so this was our, from our first paper where we made these and just sent the first year organic things just to get tested. And we weren't able to get a crystal structure, but we we're pretty sure that what they were. And some of them, did. These, these plots here are liver cells. What he does in the untreated cases is those are liver cells that um, are, uh, they're put onto a plastic plate and that makes them unhappy. And they start to go what's called fibrotic. They start to form fibers. So they're not, they're kind of like linear, not spherical like they should be when they're happy. And then here's with just DMSO. And then here's with the compounds at various concentrations. You can see that some of them start going back spherical um, which is kind of what you want. Um, and we also looked at protein expression and so on. Um, and this was published in Bioorganic and MedChem Letters. So I'm an inorganic chemist and I've published in a journal of physical chemistry and a bioorganic MedChem uh, journal, which is kind of silly if I thought that that would happen like five years ago, uh, before this, you know, before I got into bioinorganic chemistry. So what about metals, right? We wanted to put metals on there. Uh, it didn't work out. <laughs> so I was trying to put platinum or gold um, and we kept on getting weird things. Like we, we'd look for the platinum or gold complex, we wouldn't see it. We'd actually lose signals in the NMR. Um, and so we finally grew a crystal structure and it was the carbocation. It's a stable carbocation with a chloride floating around as a the anion. Um, it's, if you're an organic chemist or have taken organic chemistry, you might finally realize why it's so stable, which took me a while because I wasn't thinking about it, but it's got tons of resonance. You can um, resonate these double bonds into that carbocation, and then it can go all the way out into some of these heteroatoms. Um, so yeah, it's just really, really stable carbocation um, to the point that we got the crystal structure. And the platinum and gold parts of it, you couldn't quite sort out. I think it's forming like, you know, polymeric powders or something binding the sulfur. Um, and this kind of makes sense now when I look back at it in hard soft acid base theory, which is something that's pretty big and important in bioinorganic chemistry and it's soft acids like soft bases. Well, um, metals in the, their late transition metals, low oxidation states and further, further down in the periodic table are soft. Um, so mercury is soft, platinum is soft, gold is soft, silver is soft. They like soft bases, which are big and fluffy like sulfur. So that kind of makes sense. But anyways, we thought it was cool we could crystallize the carbocation and, and publish that in that paper as well. Um, so then I got really curious about this because kind of, you know, once curiosity gets hold, I just want to really learn about something. So my students and I, um, we just spent some time really understanding that, that CS linkage. And so, yeah, soft metals broke, but not hard metals. So zinc didn't break it. Um, alkali metals didn't break it. And then you could even reduce it off with sodium borohydride if you did it in isopropanol. Now that doing it in isopropanol means you can heat it up. Um, it doesn't react, sodium borohydride reacts with water and methanol and ethanol at room temp, but isopropanol is bulky enough that it doesn't. So you can actually reduce it off um, to make the kind of alkane or alkyl group here, which is kind of cool. Um, we did finally get a crystal structure and you can see that the sulfur, carbon sulfur bond is pretty long and is bent over the other structure. I like. I've learned to use density functional theory and you can look at orbitals like this is the highest occupied molecular orbital which has a big fat p orbital 
on the sulfur. And so if this is acting like a base, it might grab that big fat P orbital on the sulfur, which would then break, help break that sulfur carbon bond. So that makes sense. Um, we also looked at UV vis and fluorescence. These things are called chromines because they light up. They're colorful, they're like a red or a yellow, and they emit colors too when you um, shine um, higher energy light on them. So they've got fluorescence properties. And then of course, Dr. Wars also tested them but, um, with these uh, a different set that we'd made for this paper. We published in the New Journal of Chemistry. Um, he tested them for biological activity. Um, one of the things I did to try to figure out about this cleavage of that CS bond was I used some DFT calculations. So what I did is I calculated um, breaking that bond heterolytically to make a carbocation and a sulfur anion. And I did that for um, different substituents on the X here and different R groups. And you can see they're all about the same except that the um, nitrogen is more stabilizing for the carbocation, so it's more favorable. Um, but then I did it radically. I did a homolytic, so forming a radical here and a radical here. And you can see that these numbers, while they're low, are higher than the carbocation um, for versions, telling us it's more favorable to do this carbocation chemistry than radical chemistry. Now, that's not much of a surprise, but it's interesting if you look at down below here, what if you just put a simple R group on your sulfur, like a methyl or a diphenyl methyl? Um, these are now much harder to break for the um, for the heterolytic cleavage and then actually they're more easy to break radically so the radical cleavage the homolytic cleavage is more favorable with these species so this just goes to show that it is indeed the massive conjugation that you've got in this carbocation that stabilizes it so much that it makes this type of carbocation um, sulfur anion chemistry favorable over radical chemistry. And this is just one example of how density functional theory can be a useful tool to understand reactivity. So what about metals, right? We haven't tested any metals yet. So we finally um, started to do that. We sent Dr. Wars just some known gold and platinum complexes and they tested them. They actually found some interesting things with the gold one complexes, oranifin, which is a commercially available uh, rheumatoid arthritis drug and this triphenylphosphine gold chloride. These ones, um, compared to all the others, these ones were the most interesting because they in inhibited the fibrotic morphology. Um, they really affected the liver um, kind of uh, inflammation proteins. Um, and then in, in cells that had hepatitis C virus parts in them, it also reduced hepatitis C replication proteins. So that's kind of cool. So it's just promising for um, future studies for treating hepatitis C and liver fibrosis. And so um, this was most of the testing was done by um, uh, Michael Stratton, um, or sorry, Matthew Stratton, who was a student uh, in Gulam's lab and is now um, doing more work in a different lab in the Roslyn Franklin. We published that in the Journal of Inorganic Biochemistry. So um, that's not the end of the story, of course. Um, we, we're still pursuing this. One of the ideas we have is we want to get rid of that weak CS linkage. So we're trying other things. It turns out you can use the CS group as a leaving group and you can replace it with nitrogens, which are stronger nucleophiles, more basic. And so we could even do this exchange. We found other ways of making this too from independently to prove that it was this. Um, we were also able to get a crystal structure of these and, um, and we have done DFT on them. So we've got kind of a full story of these and then something really weird happens, right? And that's what gets me excited is when weird things happen and then you can say, what's going on? So one of the weird things that happened was when we took one of these amine complexes that we'd made and tried to grow a crystal structure from a mixture of solutions that had acetone in it, we get this thing. Um, and if you look at this, it looks kind of weird, but what's happened here is you've lost the amine and then you've added one, two, three carbons. And those are from acetone. Now, this is interesting because we could envision making a whole bunch of different things from different ketones, maybe changing the R group here. We could look at this species as a drug or again, as a luminescent material. Um, so we're still trying to figure out the mechanism of this. So how exactly does it happen? Um, but we have a crystal structure of this to, to prove it. Now, unfortunately, um, you know, when you do research in an undergraduate institution, things are on a slower pace. And so we kind of got scooped uh, just recently, a paper was published on the synthesis of these things, and they tested them against um, 
cancers, actually, I think breast cancers, which is cool. Um, and it shows that these are drug-like molecules. But um, I think we can still contribute more to that, that story because we have crystal structures and um, also this interesting reactivity. So we're working on writing up this. And in the future, we'd also like to try to replace, just get rid of the nitrogen or sulfur and look at just the parent CH2 here, or maybe having only carbon substituents off. Um, so this collaborative project became a, went from a kind of a small idea meeting in, in coming up with the grant and then um, into a large multi-year research project. So with this project, um, I kind of went down the bioorganic path in a way and learned a lot about um, these chrominopyridines and liver fibrosis. Um, and they're interesting motifs for the drug molecules, but also they're very luminescent. So maybe there's something to do with, that could be done with, um, you know, their, their luminescent behavior. And the fact that gold complexes um, are promising for liver fibrosis and hepatitis C, I think means that that's something that, that's worth exploring further. Um, and again, we're trying to make these chrominopyridines without these CS linkers or any other header atom there and to try to finally get a metal bound to that pyridine um, and then, you know, see what they can do. So. Um, again, I'd love to find collaborators to test metal complexes and chromiopyridines, um, or things like this against any disease or pathogen, just to see what they can do. Um, I'm always open to talk to people about collaboration and, and research. So, um, with that, I'd like to thank the funding. I, we haven't been able to get an external grant, um, but I did have those internal grants that were really good. Argonne National Lab, you basically apply for, for bean time and it's free. The only thing you have to pay for is the hotel. Um, I've had a fantastic group of undergraduate and master students through my, in my lab over the years, past and present. Um, they're all great and doing amazing things. Um, and then collaborators help get the job done. So Dr. Worst and Dr. Patil from RFUMS, my uh, colleague, Dr. Jin, who's in my department, who's a, a specialist in ITC, the beamline scientist who helped us at Argonne, um, my crystallographer, all the crystal structures were done by Dr. Roger Summer at NCSU, um, and he's been great to us. Uh, the, I talked about my colleague Graham Griffin, who's uh, interested in photochemistry, and so he was the one that did some photochemistry of the zinc AHQ species. And then um, DOZI NMR was done by Bob Lesur, who was at Chicago State at the time, but is now at SUNY Brockport. Um, and again, DOZI is an NMR technique that allows you to, to see how big something is or how slowly or fast it diffuses through solution. So it's great for polymers, nanoparticles, and so on. And finally, um, I think what I learned from this all experience, starting out as an organometallic chemist and then kind of going off into these other areas, is that inorganic chemistry and the foundation knowledge I got uh, from that, it's actually in a lot of different um, places like biology and related areas, it plays a big role. And no matter what you study, you can go in new directions, you can learn new tools, and just explore what you find interesting. And then collaborating um, is really a great way to get things done, especially if you work at a PUI, um, and also a way to come up with great new ideas and things that are to try. Um, and especially collaborating outside your field. Like I've learned a lot just by, you know, collaborating with medicinal chemists and, um, and you know the, the molecular biology folks, and really see kind of things that from a different lens. So keep being curious and keep learning is kind of would, what I would say here at the end of this talk. And with that, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah. So there's plenty of, of companies looking at, at these types of things, but I think it depends on um, patents at this point, like what's patentable. Um, so for example, I do know that um, Verena Stat in the when it was developed in the early 2000s, that was on, done by Merck. Um, and then, um, you know, so I think a lot of different companies would be interested in, in looking at these materials, but it really depends on what useful purpose they have. Um, it could be something like antibacterial. And, you know, I know there's a big push for finding, you know, small, cheap drugs that you can use as antibacterial to fight things like MRSA um, or et cetera. So it really depends right. on what the company is interested in, but there's a lot of companies out there working in various avenues. Um, to try to target all sorts of different things. Nice. Okay. Um, I'll let there's I'll let anybody that wants to ask questions from the chat go ahead and start loading them in. Um, but I, I have a few questions myself. Um, 
So I know I have a, a little bit of familiarity with XFs um, back in around 2011 or so when I was in grad school, uh, a colleague of mine used XFs. Uh, it was actually with Zinc as well, but he was looking, if I remember correctly, he was looking at how zinc oxide forms when you do it when you do electro depositions mm -hmm. and i remember when he was working on the the fitting uh, like you kind of talked about he i remember he had he had just a, a really like like you described it was, it was it was a difficult process but once he had it he could you know he could extract all this information from it and i was wondering could you, mm -hmm. could you talk a little bit more about the technique itself um and yeah. and, and you sort of i guess how much I know you, you described that at least the initial fitting, you start with that, that first coordination circle, mm -hmm. but um, like beyond, can, can you extract more information beyond that or is, there, is it limited to sort of the immediate neighborhood? No, there's, so there's scattering, it tracks the scattering events and the scattering events get harder to follow when they're further off. You get more kind of dis dispersion and, and stuff, but you can, you can basically get the first coordination sphere and then the one other sets of atoms behind it. Um, so, for example, the, the, the structure that was the bound DMSOs, it actually fit better when I had the oxygens and the sulfurs in the, as, as a scattering inputs. So it can okay. steer further. Um, and then, so for solids, it's almost a little bit easier because you have this repeating unit. And so if you have a zinc oxide, zinc oxide, like you can see the zinc scattering the oxygen, but also scattering to the other zinc. Okay. Uh, and so it really depends. Each each element scatters based on its number of electrons, and okay. so its size basically. And so uh, you can basically it's element specific, and because you can tune the energy to the element you want, you're only looking at the scattering from zinc, um, not okay. scattering. Okay. Okay. So like so you're seeing that the, the zinc is the the, the origin um, of your scattering. Okay. So so it's, so it's not cool something element. like because I had thought it was something like um, like uh, elemental dispersion. Uh, uh, like you see everything yeah like like yeah. edx where it where it just kind of yeah. you know it, it it's it hits all the individual like you can see all the individual atoms but it's no, all kind of coming off at once no this we're just looking at the zinc k edge which is a specific excitation okay. edge for zinc and so only zinc's electrons are being excited and when they come back down they emit fluorescent x-rays and that's sorry the x-rays are being what's scattered okay. Uh, okay um so you can so you could target it to your element. So I could take that same molecule and target just the, you know, sulfur or just, you know, mm -hmm. just specific elements and get just the geometry. It also tells you about oxidation state. Um, okay. That, that was going to be my next question. <laughs> two stains, but since all zinc is always zinc two plus in all these complexes, we didn't look at that. For the cobalt complexes, we did because they could be cobalt two or cobalt three. Um, right. But you can get it's from Zanes, which is, it's the same same experiment, it's just a different part of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. You can get information about the um, oxidation state of the metal. Okay, that's interesting. It's um, really, really powerful. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, like I said, that's that was the main thing I remembered was you know he had all the, you know all we saw were these these wave structures, but you know it, once he had it fitted, he was like, and based on this, I can tell you know that this thing is happening, and I can see what the oxidation state is, and I know exactly how it's coordinated. And I was like. This is incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. An amazing but, thing. but you need the synchrotron to do it because you need extremely um, well focused and mm -hmm. energy specific x rays. Like you tune right. the x ray energy. You know. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I, th I think he actually went to Argonne as well yep. uh, when he I've did seen, it. Like, but. I've done it. At, so Argonne, Brookhaven, um, there's one in, in Stanford, so Slack or SSRL. Okay. Um, and then one in Berkeley. There's got to be a couple others in the U.S., but there's Canadian. Yeah. Can, there's the Canadian Light Source. There's you know, the okay. European ones. There's there's several dozen around the world. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so with the 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 biological um, work, um, the, the, and this is the, now I'm I'm way outside of my my <laughs> familiarity. Um, how do you, can you talk a little bit about how you know? Like like you you had mentioned that the platinum the platinum and gold complexes you kind of had at least an expectation that they might do something. Yeah. Can you give a little bit of background on that? Yeah. So so there's a huge literature in, in platinum um, chemistry for cisplatin, which is a common anti-cancer drug, was discovered accidentally. Okay. Um, a guy was trying to, to looking at how electrochemical potentials affected cell growth, and he saw that sometimes when he did it, his, these cells would stop. 
they wouldn't die, but they would like stop growing. And okay. then he couldn't figure out why. And then it, serendipitously, he figured out that it's because on his electrode that he was oxidizing, he was putting some platinum two, um, some platinum two species into solution. Um, oh. And and he was using an ammonia buffer, and so it was making these platinums with two ammonias and two chlorides on them, and that's just platinum. That's awesome. And then, yeah, and then it was found out it treats cancer, like testicular cancer and some other uh, cancers, and it's it's still really commonly used. And there's a few more iterations mm. of it, carboplatin, and they just changed the ligands with still platinum too. Right. Um, um, Stephen Lippard is a guy who's done tons of work on that. Um, and has taken it all the way into the, the clinic. Um, and then the gold ones, gold has been used as medicine since ancient times, 3,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but not that it worked back then, but um, you know, so <laughs> they're just like eating gold. Um, right. but, so it turns out that gold one um, is soluble and it, they found that it can treat rheumatoid arthritis and it attacks, um, it binds to these, um, to like, th uh, redox proteins that are involved in inflammation and shuts down these kind of inflammation pathways. Okay. So I actually have a colleague who studies a certain type of caspase enzyme that's an inflammation caspase. Mm -hmm. And we tested some gold compounds. You know, I gave her some gold compounds. I said, try this out. And sure enough, it, they're really good at inhibiting that enzyme's activity, which the activity of that enzyme is to turn on like inflammation. And so Interesting. Um, that makes sense for rheumatoid arthritis, right? You know, which is yeah. inflammation. But it's, these things also seem to work for other, like there's literature and gold compounds for uh, all sorts of things, including coronavirus. Um, I saw a preprint in bioarchive of people trying to use oranifin to treat um, uh, coronavirus. That, but, um, I mean, I could, wait, might as well. Why not? <laughs> yeah, try everything you can. Um, one of the things that I'm thinking of doing soon is there's this guy in, um, there's a center in Australia that studies MRSA and other kind of, bacterial mm -hmm. and fungal pathogens and they've got a high throughput system so you can send them one milligram Ooh. of sample and they can test on all of them so you, i'm going to send him just one a few milligrams of like everything i've got in my lab yeah it, and then see what hits right and see what's yeah uh, and it's part of this project he's on that's fully funded that they're trying to basically make a database of tons of molecules and how they affect these like I think half a dozen or eight different um you know, pathogens that's fantastic. That's that's so, really handy too, especially like you said, it's fully funded, so you don't have to worry about the cost. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so I don't have to try to find a client. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And get that's... convinced them to spend the time to do something. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I've got another question from the chat here. This is also from Freddie B. Uh, he says he, he's asking if you are familiar with the company uh, Unity Biotechnology. Apparently, they're California based. No, Unity Biotech. Yeah. No. Okay. I'm not super familiar with many things. Like my sister does work in biotech, mm -hmm. um, but but I've only um, you know I'm, I'm only passingly familiar with some most companies. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Um, I'll have to you. So with the the photochemistry, can you talk a little bit more about that as well? That's, yeah, that's, so that's more back in my, that's back in my yeah, ballpark. Yeah. So so. Um, in OLEDs, I think is either the light emitting layer or, or something, the aluminum ALQ is a common one. Okay. It's aluminum tris-hydroxyquinoline. And so it turns out you can use the zinc AHQ in place of it. And so I'm oh. curious is if you can modify the AHQs, you can change the color or the energy or something, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's been explored a lot. Um, I do know that like they've been made, people have like, um, and, and a lot of these references are in the J the JCAM um, the Dave Fiskem paper. Okay. There, people have like used it as kind of like sensors where they'll put like a layer of this stuff down and mm -hmm. then you can shine light on it. It'll emit one wavelength, but in the presence of certain gases, it'll emit a different wavelength. Yeah. Um, so okay. things like that. So, and it's due to um, the pi pi star excitation of the 8HQ ligands themselves. So the zinc is kind of just acting like a placeholder. The zinc isn't, isn't, it's not redox active. It's not photoactive. It's, it's just kind of coupling those two chromophores together, the, the eight HQs, they're close enough that they can okay. couple and it makes the, the, um, yeah. So we, we did some transient absorption spectroscopy um, mm -hmm. on them to figure out like excited states and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm, I'm not, that, that was Dr. Griffin. That was Graham's stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah no, they're, they're definitely very colorful. 
Yeah. And they're used in OLEDs um, or can be used in OLEDs. Right. I don't know if they're commercially used. That's pretty cool. Um, all right. Are there any final questions from the chat? I'll give, I'll give them another minute or two. Um, with the, so I'm not, I, 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 I haven't done a lot of NMR or basically none, yeah. um, but I, but I'm pretty familiar with, you know, what kind of information you get from that. But I, I've, I've actually never heard of Dosi before. Yeah. Dosi um, is awesome. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it requires certain gradients and, and so like not all NMRs can do it, mm -hmm. but it basically it, it pulses them and then kind of watches the decay that is related to their tumbling and solution. Okay. And so, so if that, de that decay is basically proportional or related to them diffusing in, through solution. Okay. Um, and so things that diffuse, you know, that are bigger will give you a smaller diffusion constant. Sure. And so you can literally size nanoparticles in solution using NMR, or you can, oh. you can look at and, see, and say like, you can separate, so they say you got a forest of peaks, but on your other axis, what it'll do is that force will separate out into a monomer and dimer that have different sizes. Yeah. Um, so, so that's why we were doing it, just looking for clusters. Okay. Um, so so it's, 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 is it positional? Like, like, is, is that what it's looking? Is it, is it like, is it, is it basically? It doesn't taking tell a, you. It's, like it's a, not. A, I mean, it's like it's average diffusion through solution. So the, the solution is homogeneous. Right. Everything's mixed and, and equally mixed, but it's it in the second axis that it creates. It you create a two D um, two D plot now instead of a one D NMR, and mm -hmm. so one axis is the diffusion constant and then the other axis is your peaks okay and so it'll put your like looking down on top of your peaks as opposed to looking to the side you'll see the peaks at this diffusion constant and then you'll see the peaks at the other diffusion constant as a line i got you um and so yeah it's it's um like i said i can i can send you some papers about nanoparticles or polymers like you can do it with mixtures of polymers and basically get a distribution on size right uh, yeah that's a that's a very powerful technique I mean, I, you know, I've done I've done diffusion measurements on on particles using like you know dynamic light scattering and uh, zeta measurements and you know zeta zeta potential measurements and stuff like that. But like I said, I had never even heard of dosi. Yeah, and the way it works is you're looking at the proton NMR of the ligands that are capping capping the nanoparticles. So let's say they're like okay. long, they're you know octane thiol or, or like yeah. um, topo or something. You're just looking at the proton NMR of those. That makes a lot of sense. That, that's a simple way to do it, but like I said, very, very powerful way to do it. Um, okay, uh, Freddie has another question for you. He wants to know if you could talk a little bit about some of the latest techniques in um, in basically trying to fight cancer cells. Um, and you, you talked about you know some of some of your work. Um, are there other sort of cutting edge yeah. techniques right now? Well, so in terms of the the gold and the and the platinum, um, there's. It's been some interesting, there's lots of, tons of work out there. And again, I would suggest there's, I think Steve Lippard has some great reviews on platinum chemistry. Okay. One of the more recent things is creating these pro drugs. Um, so the pro drug idea with platinum is that you, you instead of using platinum two, which is the, the drug, active drug species, you use platinum four. Um, okay. And platinum four is, is octahedral. So you can put other ligands on it and you can use those ligands to, if you want it to be lipophilic, you make those greasy. If you want it to be certain, you know, you know, sugars or something, you can put them there, and those help guide it to where it needs to be. And then it's reduced in by your body um, over time, so it's not like you know, those things don't come off right away. Right. And that basically allows it to be less damaging um, to the body. So chemo, when you take a platinum-based cancer anti-cancer drug, it's pretty rough. Yeah. You know, we're talking all the side effects, and that's because Platinum likes doesn't just bind to the DNA of, of the tumor cells; it binds to everything else in your body. Your right. body becomes a giant ligand. But if you can keep it as platinum four, then it's it's what's called octahedral coordinately saturated. There's no place for it to bind things, and so it can't bind to anything until it's reduced. And hopefully, by then, with the ligands you put on there that will come off later, it's guided it to where it needs to be, and so you can use a lower dose, uh, and have less side effects. Okay. So. So the, one of the big issues is is that the other big issue is um, is uh, over time some cell lines skin cancers are becoming um, uh, you know resistant to certain types of drugs like okay. platinum, and so that's why we need to keep finding other drugs um, because if they become resistant to platinum maybe we can use the gold drugs or maybe we can use organic drugs. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like a constant war because these things are you know just like all cells they're mutating and adapting. Um, so it's kind of, yeah. you know, 
we have to keep adapting and improving as well. We can't just stick with one drug and say, okay, we're done. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's yeah. That's, that's interesting. I, Cause I, I, I'm familiar with some of the targeting that's been done. Um, like you talked about with the ligands, but I wasn't aware that they were working on what amounts to, uh, like a, a, a drug release version. And that's, that's a really creative, really creative way yeah. to get around the issues that you run into. Yeah, you can also do, there's a big issue, big work in like photoactive too. Like you could mm -hmm. basically like shine a light only on the tumor. Yeah. And that only activates it there. Whereas if the rest of your body, your just body just excretes it. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, that's, like that's, that. what, I was, that's what I was about to ask you about was if there's any crossover. Because I, I, I've read a few papers on, um, it, it uses nanoparticles. So not, not the ionic species, but it, but it basically takes, you know, uses nanoparticles capsule with something that that you know only goes to the tumor mm -hmm. and you shine the, the you know visible light on it or whatever it you get the plasma resonance which heats up yep. the particles yeah, and kills the cell yep. yeah cool, so yeah. is there any crossover there between like like you talked about you know if you, you want to selectively reduce you know in the right place is there any work being done in that regard where you like you use the ligands you target it once it gets there then you say you know you do some some light therapy or something like that and yeah. and yeah, there's plenty, of, plenty of that. Um, okay. and there's also um, not, these aren't related to platinum, but it's other drugs that where they have carbon monoxide or, or NO ligands, and then mm -hmm. they release them um, in situ again with light or or some change in, in condition, and so they're called quorums or norms. Um, so CO releasing molecules or NO releasing molecules, right? Okay. So CO and NO are, are normal in very small doses. They're in our bodies already, right? But they, we know that they're toxic. Um, to the human body at high, at high doses, but mm -hmm. it's selective targeting dosing. You can kill cancer cells with them or, or, or other malignant cells. And so it's, again, this idea of you deliver it to the target and then you shine a light and that weakens the metal ligand bond. And so it releases the CO. Okay. Right which are these, they then can cause, you know, all sorts of problems there in the sure. near entire body. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's really fascinating. Like I said, you know, I, I had a, a passing familiarity with it, but I didn't realize that, that, that this, that, that field was so robust. Yeah. It's, and that's the thing was like, I knew nothing about this before going to the workshop and the workshop, once I started to start scratch the surface, I was like, there's a lot of cool stuff here. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. You know, and so I, I started to kind of go down the path of, and that's why I like, I think I said early on, I've taught a master's level, um, bioinorganic class. And it's great because it's, Every year it's different because I let the students pick the journal articles they want to give talks on. We read some chapters that give like the background information, but the literature we just dive in. And every, you know, there's so many different things going on. Oh yeah, well, that's, but, that's that's the best way to do it too, because that's that's how you get the the real cutting edge. I mean, that's yep. you know, it's it's literally the brand new stuff coming out. So that's that's a great thing to do. Yep. Um, well, I think unless there's, right. if there's any other questions from chat, go ahead and get them in real quick. Um. But I think otherwise, we'll call it a night. Uh, yep. I need to thank Kyle. Thank you again for coming on. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, like I said, the talk was interesting, both in terms of the research that's being done, as well as the the sort of how you arrived on the on that journey. Yeah. And uh, you know, thank you for coming on. Uh, thank you to your your students for coming out. A couple of them were in chat and said that you gave a great talk. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to get, I tried to get them to grill you with some questions, but they were nice. Um. But again, right. thank you for coming on, and uh, yep. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It's and, been awesome. Uh, absolutely. I'll hopefully see, and I'll be on to watch you talks in the future. So that would be wonderful, and uh, you know, I hope you'll I hope you'll come back on at some point in the future as well. Yep. All right. All right. I think I'm right. gonna sign off. All right. Thanks a lot, Kyle. Have a good night. And thank good you night. to everybody for coming. And uh, you know, this stream will be uploaded to YouTube in a little bit. And uh, yeah, thank you all for coming out. Please come by next week. We'll have, uh, let's see, we have Dr. Prale Santra talking next week. Um, he will be talking to us about uh, determining the fine structure of, uh, the fine heterostructure of nanoparticles, actually. Um, his is more in the solar energy field, um, but it should be another interesting talk. Uh, I hope everybody comes out. Uh, and with that, thank you again, Dr. Grice. Thank you, everybody, and have a good night.